All right, we might as well begin. It's now or never. So welcome everybody um, to Coastal Corals online edition hosted by Reef Check. Um, before we begin, I just want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land which we're on. For me, that's the Cubby Cubby people, um, but there's different people all over the nation. Um, we just want to acknowledge elders past, present and future. And thank you for coming along to tonight's event. We have a wonderful Dr. Merrick Atkins um, presenting a talk on carnivorous sponges. Um, before we begin, we're just going to go through a couple of things. Um, in case you haven't heard of Reef Check Australia before, we're a nonprofit organization. Um, we're mainly based in Southeast Queensland. However, um, we're all over Australia and the world. I think we're over uh, 90 different countries um, across the globe. Um, and we pair hands-on research. We go out and do survey diving um, to monitor the health of our reefs over a long period of time um, with conservation and community engagement. So we go out into the community and host events such as this one um, to try and educate, empower, and um, pretty much just talk to people about what's going on in conservation, in science, um, and how they can help themselves. Um, so thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, we hope you enjoy. A little bit of housekeeping um, in case you're unfamiliar with Zoom, which is probably, um, well, unrealistic considering the COVID environment we're in. Um, if you could just uh, mute yourself um, as well as turn off your video. Um, and if you have any questions, yeah. feel free to add them into the chat. Um, just so the bandwidth of the video goes strong and we have um, no little hiccups um, in relation to the internet. Um, if you're not on the mailing list and you want to, seq events at reefaustralia.org is our mailing list. Um, we send out monthly emails with heaps of conservation action that you can do, as well as just general updates. Um, and if you have any questions, like I said earlier, um, please use the chat box and I'll be able to communicate that um, to Merrick. We will, just before I hand it over, um, have a group photo where I'll ask everyone just to turn their camera on um, and we'll take a screenshot just to post for social medias. Um, sometimes we don't get fantastic photos, but um, I have a feeling we're all super photogenic tonight and it'll be amazing. Um, if you don't want your name to be on this uh, photo, please do um, hop on to participants and uh, edit your name um, to use a fake one if you want to. Um, you're also more than welcome to not turn your camera on. It's not, um, we're not gonna force you to. Um, and just to let everybody know this uh, is being recorded um, and it will be put up on YouTube as well. So again, if you don't feel comfortable, um, please send me a message or any of the co-hosts, um, not including Merrick, a <laughs> scientist, and they'll be able to help you out. A few upcoming events um, in the local area, just in the Southeast Queensland area, if you are a local, um, we host a monthly beer yoga, which you get to see my beautiful face at. Um, it's at the Your Mates Brew House um, down in Kiwana. Um, it's $35, which includes two beers and one hour of awesome yoga. Um, I definitely would book because we do sell out a couple of these events um, and they are super, super fun. Um, it sounds like a weird mix, mixing yoga and beer, but we make it work. We do also um, have a beach cleanup if you feel like getting down and dirty. Um, Surf Rider Sunshine Coast are hosting their biannual cleanup um, at Double Island uh, Point. Due to COVID, um, restrictions, the event keeps changing. So for the latest um, and most up-to-date info, please head on over to their Facebook page, so Friday Sunshine Coast, um, and you'll find more details about that there. But it's on the 16th and 17th of October. Horizon Festival is another festival that's unfortunately been affected by COVID-19, like we all have, I guess. Um, so some events are canceled, although it is a two week uh, festival um, and it does have some COVID safe events. 
Um, so if you Google for, uh, the festival, it's being held all over the Sunshine Coast from Noosa down to um, Iwa, I believe, um, with a wide variety of not only environmental um, events, but also a lot of cultural stuff as well. Um, so it's a great mix, really. And we do also have next month's Coast of Corals talk. Um, next month, we have Rebecca. She is originally from Southeast Queensland, like we are, although she now works um, in the private sector as an environmental consultant over in the United Arab Emirates um, in Dubai. Um, so we'll be hearing a lot about what she does over there, what her job entails, as well as reef check projects on the other side of the world, which I'm really excited for. If you ever want to get involved and volunteer and become an amazing human, like me and so many others are, um, head on over to www.reefcheckaustralia.org. Um, you can become a volunteer just like I am um, in engaging the community and trying to educate them over several things. If you are a scuba diver, you are also more than welcome to help join and become a survey diver for us. Um, we have Australia-wide accreditations um, for scientific diving and such. And as always, don't be afraid to follow us on our socials. We're most active on Facebook and Instagram. Um, this is where we post all of our events um, and awesome things that are happening. Um, and uh, lastly, thank you to everybody that sponsors this event. Um, events like these, um, grassroots environmental action really, cannot be held without the support um, and donations of all these amazing councils, such as Sunshine Coast Council, Townsville, Gold Coast, Brisbane, um, and private businesses such as Mask Events and Clean Water. A huge shout out to all of them um, for making this possible. And a big thank you to all the active volunteers that we have. I know this photo is a little outdated, but there are a lot of people even in the audience tonight um, that know who this is aimed at. So a big thanks to you guys. And without further ado, we would like to introduce Merrick, um, tonight's speaker. Um, so Merrick studied a Bachelor of Science and an Honours degree at UQ in research. Um, he followed that up with a PhD in the field of molecular genetics in plant pathology on diseases on sunflowers, which is a super niche yet interesting um, topic um, to jump into. Um, another awesome thing Merrick has done is worked across a million different disciplines, um, which as a scientist isn't too common. Normally they spend 30 years looking at crabs or something and that's it. But he's worked as a science communicator for news networks. Um, he's been a physics research scientist at QUT, um, a plant pathologist, um, and he's now a marine biologist for the Queensland Museum. Um, he's a well-published scientist across a million different fields, such as population genetics, marine ecology, ta uh, taxonomy, um, and a couple others down there. Um, and without spilling all the beans, I'll hand it over to you, Merrick. So I'll just stop sharing. And if you would like to share, please do. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, my name is Mary Keaton. As Pablo just said, I work at the Queensland Museum. My official title here is Collection Manager of Sessile Marine Invertebrates. Uh, as Pablo alluded to, I used to be a plant pathologist, but I decided that scuba diving was more fun than sunflowers. So I, decided, um, I was able to make that change to the job at the museum here. So. I'll just share my screen and, and leap into it. Working, telling me again. Is that working for anyone else there? We have your screen. Um, if you, yeah, you're just about to click the button to put it into presenter mode. All right. 
Yeah, can I just jump in and say that um, we're having trouble with the audio from Merrick. All right, if I lean a bit closer, is that better? I lean ah, that's more. better. Yes, thank you. Thanks, right. Julie. There we are, perfect. Thanks, Merrick. All right, yep. So I'm going to talk about all the different groups I work on, and then we'll end up um, focusing on kind of a sponge. Now, um, your screen, oh, there we go. Um, a lot of the work we do, like you guys and I guy, I do, it's all in up in the very shallow water here, which we can scuba dive in, and that's great. So, you know, on average, it's about the top 30 meters, or we go out with the Frenchies, you can go down, these people go down 60 meters, and some, uh, some people on the river either go down to 120 meters, but that's outside me. But anyway, and so later, I'll we'll start talking about all that shallow water stuff, but then later on, we'll go down the Bissell zone and down to the, the Bissell zone and the continental shelf where it ends off Australia and down the ocean floor at about 4,000 metres. So first off, um, yeah, the fun bit, scuba diving. I mean, hey, that's why we're all here. We love the reef and everything in it. Um, one of the main groups I work on is sponges. It quickly go through some of the other groups I go through. I also work on the hard corals, the hex corals. So, you know, in some ways they're, they're done to death. But people are now doing genetic work on them and they're gonna try and turn the tables on what we know about hard corals, so they're obviously the fragile ones that we're worried about that are going to be most affected by this um, by climate change. Here I've got a whole lot of fossil opera, but it's actually usually the properas which are going to fall over the plate corals and staghorn. Whereas things like parietes, the big boulders, so we think they'll actually manage to cope with um, changes in CO2 and, and temperatures. Um, other groups in the Nidarians. Nidarians are all the family of stingers, like when you think about jellyfish. So I work on anemones, um, ox corals, zoanthids. I've got some black corals in there as well. Um, Octocorals, we're hard corals, um, and otherwise known as hexacorals. So they've got six um, tentacles, whereas octocorals have got eight, that's why they're called octo. So if you, when you scuba dive, if you get up really close, you can actually count the tentacles and it's on another slide. That one there. This is a little xenia. Has anyone ever seen these? They're, they're about, this is probably about the size of your fist. But these guys open and shut like little flowers. So they're really cute, really active sort of thing. So backtrack a bit. Now, octocorals, on one hand, you can actually get them to genus quite well morphologically in, in, the, in the field. But if you look at the bottom one, the bottom screen down here, you can actually see the individual sclerites that make up these octocorals. And that's to get to species, that's what we have to do. We have to look at these things under a microscope. Um, this, is, this is another um, scleronip here, and you can see the beautiful sclerites there, the polyps. And this is what it looks like under a microscope. Well, these are two different unrelated genera, but I have these beautiful sclerites under the microscope, and that's what we need to tell the species. Unfortunately, a lot of this work was done hundred or so years ago and there's a little dried up little fragment in, in a museum in Europe that may or may not have been bombed during the Second World War and if you can get hold of that you can look at these because the old descriptions were very poor handwritten people like Linnaeus who just wrote two, two sentences to describe the whole species and now we've got to unfortunately go back and get the live stuff and we're going to do DNA stuff on it but then try and correlate the live stuff with these dried dead specimens they referred to because they never saw these things in the field. They, they, they returned from exhibitions like the Challenge Expedition and they looked at them a year later. So uh, this is Sansibia. I don't know if you guys um, up around Caloundra, uh, especially at, um, at um, Kings Beach when the tide goes right out. On, on the rock flats there, this guy is bright blue, but a lot of people don't notice it because it's not a ledger, but if you go looking carefully for it, and it's got these fantastic opalescent type structures. So that's going to be a new species I'm describing at the moment, a local one. Sea pens are another type of octocoral. I mean, people rarely see these. I don't know if you've probably seen them in scuba diving. You go anywhere near them and they go zoop under the ground. And they're, each one of those is a colony of a hundred or thousands of little animals. So how they coordinate together to disappear under the sand in under a second, no one knows yet. Another big group I work on are the cidians or tunicates. A lot of people might know the big solitaries that hang out intertidally. Um, some people use them fishing. 
but there's a whole lot of little species that are colonial ones and they're intricate little things. And if you get your eye and you start to see them, it's just beautiful colors. And the bottom right hand one is a species I described from um, um, off Morton at uh, Flinders Reef up there. That's a new species described a couple of years ago. And here's some other beautiful ones that we're looking at at the moment. These guys, if you can see each one of these in the bottom right hand picture, see each one of these mouths. So each one of those little zooids is, is the actual animal. Well, it's the mouth of the animal. But um, they're less than a millimetre in size. And they have this common cocoa package. Like they're all stitched together like a big sewage system. And they all use the same outlet. So anyway, so under a millimetre in size, and you've got to des describe the gonads and the summit, summit shape from that. So it's quite hard. And because you can't fix them like um, sponges or octocorals, where you dissolve them in bleach, and then you end up with sterite, they don't have that. You've got to look at the whole animal. So they're hard guys to work on. Closely related to salps. I do have a question, sorry to interrupt. Um, a couple of times now you've mentioned you describe new species. What's the process of describing a new species? How do you know um, that it's new and not something um, that's already been found? Yeah, well, what you've got to do is you, you, once you work out what genus it is, then you basically, there's a couple of, of great databases now. There's one called Worms. And for sponges, we use one called World Fruit Database. But anyway, and people have laboriously already done the hard work and they've listed all the species that should occur in that genus. Of course, there's many errors and things that are missing. And then you basically go through everything in that list and try and eliminate it. And you read the original public, original descriptions. Sometimes they're very good and they've got clear illustrations. And, and some people like Ridley, who went on the Challenger expedition in the 1800s, did fantastic work. But anything done between the 1940s and 1980s is absolute crap. <laughs> and, um, and you have to get hold of these types of specimens we're talking about and you, and you have to loan them from um, museums around the world. And some of them won't lend them to you. So some, you have to fly to other countries to, go, to look at them. And so you got to look at them under a microscope and you got to get permission to basically cut them up to look them under a microscope as well. And because most of them are too old to do any DNA sequences, it's really hard. So that's what we're trying to do with a whole lot of these groups is get fresh specimens, work out what they are, and then, then we can start building that tree of DNA so we can start matching it to it. And we do the same with chemical profiles as well. It's not as well, well done, but, um, and you basically have to systematically eliminate them one at a time. That's fine if you get a small genus that's only got a couple of species, great. But there's some genera that have 200 species and that's, that might be 10 years work. Just working on that, so it's it's a slow process, unfortunately. Once you handle on a genus, then you, then you can oh start banging them out a bit faster. But so new genera are better than old genera because people working on the new have described them and described them really well. Although there are a lot of exceptions. Wow. Thank you. I've always wondered how um how a scientist does describe a new species, but like I thought, it's just a long and probably boring stringent process. Yeah, it can be. Quite exciting when you do it, but very frustrating sometimes. And and if you've got to apply, write a letter to a, a, a museum in Austria, and they'll translate it, and then six months later they'll, they'll write back and say, Yes, you can borrow it after this, and then about two years later you get the specimen. <laughs> so it doesn't happen in a hurry. Fair enough. Awesome. Jellyfish are, no, sorry. No, no, continue. I was going to say jellyfish are uh, another group I work on. On the, on the right here, we've got um, the Moorbacker, otherwise known as the Morton Bay box jellyfish. It won't kill you, we think. It'll definitely put you in hospital. That's all I want to watch out for. Um, now, hydroids, everyone probably knows hydroids, a diver, get a little zing underwater. No, anyway. So what's curious about hydroids is these are the sessile phase of jellyfish. The only problem is, there's only about a dozen species in the world where people work out what the medusoid or jellyfish is compared to the hydroid phase. So they're two different schools of taxonomy, if you like. And so, I have another question. The word yep. sessile, what does that mean? Sessile are uh, basically not moving, stuck to the ground. Okay. Stuck to the ground. So they're yeah. just jellyfish stuck to the ground. That's exactly right. The different <laughs> life phase. It's like we have a little swimming life phase, but 
don't know about you, but I can't remember when I was a sperm. So. Fair enough. Okay. Now, bryozoans, otherwise known as lace corals, you've probably, probably seen these or felt these. They're usually really rough underwater and sometimes have beautiful lace like patterns. Again, under the micro, if you look under the microscope, you start to see each one of those little animals with these little apertures there. So, again, it's another microscopic world. Brachiopods, these are another dinosaur lineage. These live out in Moreton Bay, so we're quite famous here in southeast Queensland for having species that are almost extinct in most other parts of the world. Okay, so the best part of the job when we're out scuba diving in different areas. So these are some of the field trips we want on different areas to work out what's there basically because we don't know. There. Now, I'll just go on to our map. Like I said before, we're doing the shallow water stuff here, scuba diving fun. Now we're going to talk about some deep sea cruises use the edge of the shelf and down the valleys. And you can see the whole of these are like seamounts. And they're basically islands that fail to reach mountains that fail to reach the surface. They did reach the surface before, but when sea level rose, a lot of these failed that the failed to keep up with sea level rise. I mean the coral couldn't grow fast enough to keep up with sea level. We call them sunken reefs. So a lot of stuff we use um, get down is remote operated vehicles. So they're submersibles and controlled on from the computer with joystick and all that. And so recently I was enjoying the, the Falcor expedition and the bottom right one here, the big Sue Sebastian ROV was in the water. It's down at 1500 meters. So the guys were on the deck flying by wire. And then I was in my office in Brisbane here while this is out in the coral sea, about 2000 kilometers north of us bouncing off a satellite and I'm telling the guy, no, no, go left, grab that one on the left, please. So quite cool doing all that. So that's some of the more. Sorry, so you have a live feed of that? Yeah, yeah, it was a live feed of that. It was on, it was on YouTube and um, Facebook as well. And that, that had about a 30 second delay. So we had to keep our eye on the right hand screen and people would ask us questions. So we'd have to try and answer what they're doing and tell them what we're seeing. That's amazing. So man. this is sort of example of sort of the canyons that you know, before we do these expeditions, we've got a vague idea that canyons out there, but we start doing all this bathymetric mapping of the area. Um, this is all big ship stuff. Um, and these boats are between $50,000 and $500,000 per day to hire, to use. So quite expensive kit. It's usually, it's all government sponsored in different worlds, except the, the one in the bottom, the Falcor. That's, that's Mitch Ocean Institute. And that's um, a really rich pair of Americans who we fund that research, that's really good. So I went on a cruise in 2019 and the red stripes, we went up the east coast of Australia from Tasmania up to the Coral Sea. And we were doing halfway up the, the slope and on the bottom of the floor. And this is because they've put a whole lot of new marine parks out there at, at 2000 meters, which is, which is great, but they have no idea what's down there. And I think they were actually probably selected because they were spots that weren't good for fishing or something, but anyway but you've got to celebrate these marine parks. So a lot of what we do is bathymetric mapping, as I've talked about before. So we get all these beautiful detailed maps. We have no idea what's down there before. Um, on this expedition, we just had towed cameras. So you'd run over the area once with a camera, then you'd come back again and we'd try and put, um, put a sled down. And these, these are some examples. Down the bottom is a, is a sled. And at the top here, we've got what we call a beam trawl. And we sort of try and find a spot that looks like a runway and try and find a, a flat area because you've got eight kilometers of steel cable out behind the boat and it's in 4,000 meters of water and you're trying to land it on something. So you, if it hits something, these can very easily get, get snagged up and then you've lost $30,000 of telemetry gear. So it's quite a bit of kind of fly in three dimensions to land these things on the bottom to actually go and pick up some samples. So there's people on the back deck seriously picking up samples because the water temperature down there is about 1.5 degrees. So when it comes up to the water at 18 degrees, you know, these things are like almost parboiled, if you like. Uh, we've got a little Brinky sled on the left-hand side, which is really cool. It was, it's designed, it's got bomb day doors. You can see the front open. That's designed so when it lands gently like a Santa sleigh, the doors open and it just takes the, the samples about 30 centimetres off the top. So extruding the mud, but trying to get all the living creatures that are fragile up the top. 
Um, there's my favourite, the Sherman tank, because it's big and tough. And you drag it through and it copes when you, when you run into rocks and things like that, and it gets good samples from there. So sponges, this is what I spent a lot of my time working on. They're really old, around before the dinosaurs, and they'll be around a long time after we've destroyed the planet from climate change. We've got about, in the Queensland Museum alone, 5,000 species to morpho and about 900 described. So I've got over 4,000 species to describe yet. And then every time I look at one, I go, actually, it's not one species, it's actually 10 more cryptic species in there. As soon as we do DNA sequencing on it, it splits it even more. So sponges occur everywhere, fresh water, salt water, and at every depth. And one really cool feature about them is they, they're, like, they're like stem cells. Each cell is totally potent. That, that is, the sponge can make it, okay, you can be a digestive cell now. And then once it's finished digesting, okay, you're going to turn into this sort of cell. And we don't know how it does it. Um, as I mentioned before, like oxycorals, sponges have spicules, they're silicon based. So for most of these organisms I work on, there, there are no books. You can't just like pick up a bird book or a fish book. There's no grants guide to sponges or anything like that because we just don't know. We're still another 50 years away from that point. And the fact that also things like sponges are so morphoplastic, there's probably about a handful of species that actually have a shape. You can say what they are, the rest of them. Until you look under the microscope, you've got no idea. And even things that look identical can be whole orders apart. So, and they move around too. You know, suddenly this thing will move from that family to another order uh, as we find more and more information. So this example of just some, some of the fascinating sponge spicules you might see on a sponge. And down here, we've got a zester sponge here, the barrel sponges. That's one of the few that you can tell what they are. So people have probably seen them big enough to see the diving sometimes. Now, normally sponges are filter feeders. So sponges and acidians. They're the main reason why the oceans we dive in are nice and clear. If we didn't have these guys, if these guys all died out, we'd all be swimming in brown swoops all the time. Um, they don't have particular tissues as such. So they do organize themselves into little organelles. And sponges have that classic experiment that if you've got your sponge and you put it through a liquidizer and or strained it through a bit of muslin cloth into, and, and provided you kept it all in the right seawater, then the sponge cells would all get together and they start reorganizing themselves into their, into their sponge shape again, into organelles again. So it's quite amazing. Again, we don't know how they do that. One of the groups of sponges you can actually tell underwater are calcareous sponges. And if you feel them, they feel like sandpaper. They're really rough. And these are, these are the only ones that are calcareous. The rest are all silicon based. So a special group on their own. In the deep water, we've got um, glass sponges. And the one at the top there is called a Venus basket sponge. <coughs> Very popular amongst Japanese. What happens is a, um, a young shrimp can go in through the pores and a male and female go inside and they grow together and they become so big they can no longer leave. And they breed in there and the little progeny can leave. And the Japanese people give them as wedding gifts because it symbolizes being together forever. Couple. Gemma sponges are what we call the main group of sponges. So these are aglots, this one's from Papua New Guinea. So I'm describing this as a new species. And they've got these beautiful little fields on the right hand side. There are, of course, other sponges that don't have spicules. If sponges are a basket case, these guys are the basket case of the basket cases. They are so hard to work on. They've got no obvious features on them. So totally reliant on molecular data to help with their and chemical data. They do have some fiber structure, but it's very hard to tell them apart. Now rock sponges is another group I like that work that usually about a thousand meters in depth. Um, and these guys have all these straight spicules that all intertwine together. And so they're called rock sponges. And you pick them up, they feel like a rock, they look like a rock. You throw them on the ground, they're like a rock, but they're actually solid glass. So I did some population work on these guys off these um, sea mounts off New Caledonia and showed that actually, despite them being rocks and having a free living stage that apparently crawls for three days, if it can crawl down 2,000 meters along 20 
nautical miles and up 2,000 meters within seven days, but I don't think so. Anyway, it showed they're much more well connected than we thought. So carnivorous sponges, my new favorite topic. Um, these guys have exaptation. They have all these spickles I was talking about before. And what they do is they, they use these for um, catching prey. And here's one um, isopod here. And the isopod, we're talking about probably about 100 mil, no, no, hundredth of a millimeter in size. And they catch them by these fine hairs. Of that. And so then it, then it becomes a digestive cell and digestive. So they've done this because down the bottom of the ocean, 4,000 meters, there's a lot of food to, to filter. So they've decided to eat whatever comes along. So they're really cool. I like them. So they've only recently discovered, I mean, people had described them from 100 years ago, but they didn't realize they were carnivorous until, until just recently, because someone discovered one you know, scuba dive depth cave in, in Europe and they actually observed it and actually have them in the tank growing. But anyway. So now that we know which groups are carnivorous, it's much more easy to find them. Um, on that cruise I was talking about before, I found 17 new species I just described. Named one after my son, my partner. So working on some new ones at the moment. So there's some of the shapes that look like little parasols. Most of them are only a couple of centimeters in length. So the big one in the middle is about 15 centimeters in length. But yeah, they're down between 2,000 and 4,000 meters. There's one I named after my scroll and one after my So just a quick wrap around of some of the stuff I do. I have another question. Um, do you get to choose what you name your new species or is there some sort of code in science on naming stuff? Sorry, what was that? How do you name new species uh, after uh, your well, dad and son and stuff? Is yeah, there a code on, on what it should be named or if you like your name? Uh, I try and name it obviously on, on what characteristics are particular about that species, but you can name them after certain people. Yeah, you don't, only Americans name them after themselves, but you can name them after other people who had some influence in their life. But yeah, I had 17 species, so I sort of run out of zoological inspiration at that point. <laughs> Yeah, there's no, there's no code. Awesome. I have another question, um, a couple that may or may not have been answered. Um, how much water does a large sponge filter in an hour? If you're talking about something like a barrel sponge, like, um, I think it used to be, you'd get, a, get something about this size, and it would filter like a, a big fish tank about six hours or so. so. It depends. Some of them are really efficient. Some of them just pump through a couple of litres an hour. Other ones. So. Oh, okay. Um, is there a limit to how big these kind of sponges, uh, how big their prey can be? Like, can they eat small fishes or do they only eat things like isopods and? Dino or microscopic. Uh, as far as we know, there's none that eat fish, but it's possible. I oh, know they're not as exciting as like a Venus flytrap. It's not very dramatic like that. More like the isopods crawling along and getting caught, or slowly digested. Fair enough. And yeah, maybe in the future. Um, I have a question. I have no idea what it's about. Maybe you do. What made someone decide to put a Sponge in a blender. I don't know. That was something from the 1800s. They used to do that as a, as a, I don't know, curiosity thing. They used to get the sponge and, and cut up and put it through the muslin cloth. Because you put it through the muslin cloth to make sure all the cells are individualized. It used to be a classic science experiment, but I'm not sure who did it. Someone in the 1800s or 1700s, probably. Um, another question. I'm aware there's a lot of research into the chemical composition of sponges. Um, what do what types of uses have these chemicals been put to? Yeah, well, some of the sponges that we've got for the museum, because admittedly sponges aren't a sexy thing, they're not like the charismatic megafauna. So trying to get funding for sponges is can be hard. But anyway, but in the past we've had a long association with AstraZeneca. Griffith University, 
the Institute for Drug Discovery, is it called, is it called now? And they gave us money to identify sponges and they, they look at them for bioactive compounds because sponges have the highest amount of bioactive compounds that we know of from animal and plants. Anyway, and those guys have found some anti-cancer drugs, something for Parkinson's and some pain relieving stuff as well. So that, and of course, at the moment, they're screening it for coronavirus. And I have a big That's library amazing. there and they just do a mass screening trying to find any hits. If they get some more hits, then they, um, then they run it again, they narrow it down, and then they contact us and say, can you get some more of that, please? Or what is that? I'm usually asked this. I've spent a lot of my time identifying some people around the world, chemists who go, oh, this is really interesting. We've got some active things here. Can you tell us what it is? So, That's so amazing. That's my job. So I'm a bit mercenary scientist these days. I go, yep, you have to pay for that. <laughs> Another question, um, what temperature tolerance range do carnivorous sponges have and how does the, how did they digest this? Could you explain the digestive process? Yeah, well, the ones down at the bottom of the ocean would be close to one degree and the ones in the Mediterranean probably, oh, I'm guessing about 18 degrees. So, but yeah, sponges are quite tolerant and they're one of the things that, along with ascidians, that might survive climate change because they'll probably be able to cope with better temperature things. Some sponges, have a very few amount of them, have chlorophyll as well, associated bacteria. Or something. So they'll probably get more impacted than the ones that don't. How does a sponge digest things? Well, basically you have, normally it's a filter feeder and you have little, um, have little cells that, that wave the currents through and they go for certain things. And then you have like um, basically individual cells that, are, that engulf it and digest it individually and they pass that on. So does that help, Wayne? So that's most carnivorous ones and filter feeding ones. Okay, awesome. Um, is there a biochemical mechanism or any mechanism um, to protect them from predation? Um, yes, and there's lots of things. eats them? Yeah, but everyone, everyone eats them. I mean, um, hawksbill turtles are very well known for eating some of those calcareous sponges I had on earlier. But um, sponges protect themselves physically by having all the spicules because it's basically a mouth of glass. So not many things like eating a mouthful of glass. And the second thing is, that's why they've got so many bioactive compounds is because they're engaging in sort of turf wars all the time with other algae or corals and they've all got to have their own Space. So they've all got these chemical attacks and chemical defences as well. So there's two main ways. That's awesome. I guess that does. It's full of toxic stuff and things they want to eat you. <laughs> <laughs> that does partly answer this next question, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, why does any one species of sponge adopt so many structural forms? Um, well, basically, they're affected by the current. And whether they want sunlight or not, those ones that, are, uh, that require sunlight and with other, what else is on the ground and whatever structure they're growing on. They've just got that plasticity that they don't, they don't need one body form to cope with. So, and some turtle or something does take a chunk out of it. It's growing, it's a problem. Huh. Okay, awesome. Um, and the last question we have, from here, are why sponges different colours? Um, basically, they're different colours because of the predominant chemicals within them. Okay? You know, the chemicals have different optical qualities, different wavelengths they respond to. So that's the main reason. I mean, I can't think of anything else except for the ones that have chlorophyll that obviously want to absorb sunlight. No, oh, yeah. no they're very, okay. they're very colourful. Yeah, they don't yeah. see anything. They're not responding to colour signals. So it's possible some of them have cotton onto the warning colours of fish and other things. But I don't know. Okay. I think it's awesome. a product of their, their chemistry rather than a rather than a, a evolutionary strand per se. Yeah. Um, we're getting flooded with more questions, so I'll keep them rolling. Um, 
I understand some sponges are dangerous to handle with bare skin. Is that true? And why is that? That's right. Um, there's a couple of particular black ones. Um, I approach in particular, you pick it up. Obviously, they've got toxic chemicals in them. And secondly, they've got spicules, which you can't see. And some of them you can just make out. You can feel a little bit of glass in your finger. So you've got the glass and the chemical, which is just a byproduct of, of whatever toxic thing it is to repel something else. And what it does to us, you don't notice it, but there's black one I was talking about. But then a week later, you go, oh, my skin on my whole hand's all peeling. Anyway, but yeah. I wouldn't recommend eating them. Definitely some toxic ones out there. <laughs> I'm definitely sticking to the normal supermarket sponges. <laughs> um, do they have a relationship with Zuzantelli like coral reefs do? Yeah, some of them do, yeah. Um, sponges, we often call them sponge hotels because some of them have whole, so many water capillary cavities in there that we've got things like crabs and shrimps and barnacles and things in there as well. But within the sponge itself is just this mind-boggling millions of bacterial types in there as well. And people are just trying to work out how many different classes and families of, of bacteria there are. And it's outside my area of expertise, I'm people working on that, but they have such a bacterial load. Most of the time when we talk about the protein interaction, we go, well, is it actually the sponge or is it the, the bacteria in there? Have you guys heard of the hollow biont theory? It's like, it's more the product of everything rather than the individual. It's like, we think we're this great, smart, multicellular animal. I can control exactly what I want to do and where I go. And then I think a bit of research is done to show, particularly with the gut thing, that we're all influ heavily influenced by what our bacteria are telling us. And then maybe we're just a host of millions of bacteria and they're the ones who give us desires. They're the ones who go, oh, I really need some sugar today. Or, you know, I want to go and kiss that person so I can shed bacteria. You know, so it's, it's this whole theory that, you know, we're actually a product of everything in total, not just us. Ah, and I haven't heard of that. Very much like that as well. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, another question I was about to ask, how do sponges die? And is there any way to... Yeah, carbon data sponge or tell how old it is? Can they just live yeah. forever technically? Yeah, there is. Um, how does a sponge die? Yeah, theoretically, sponges don't have a have a, a use by day like we do. Um, they couldn't theory. How would they die if they're if they're infected by a, um, some fungus or a different type of bacteria could potentially kill them, or if you know, we do get temperature rises or changes in in, in sea chemistry, or they're, they're out of the water for too long dry, it's probably the big, biggest one. Um, how long they live for? There is an example, um, someone's done some research where they've done a whole lot of sectioning of these, of these rock ones that occur in caves, and they've worked out there thousands, tens of thousands of years old. So some of them are very old. You know, it's potentially some of these ones some of these rock ones in the bottom of the ocean, <coughs> they could be a long, long time. It could be like tens of thousands of years old. We just don't know. We keep, I keep finding ones off trills off, our, off the east coast of Australia, and it's got one particular structure, and I've yet to find a new one. And I can't work out whether, you know, they've all recently died or whether they died 100 years ago or whether 10,000 years ago, and they're solid glass. You know, it's possible they died, died out 100,000 years ago or a million years ago, and they're still just there as relics undisturbed bottom of the ocean. And, and that's a great thing. Fossil record is full of sponges because they've had that silicon base. A lot of structure is kept. Uh, and there's a whole lot of those that, you know, you can trace, you can see in the fossil record and you can see them alive as well. That's awesome. That's very awesome. Um, how do you date them? Um, I don't know. I, I don't date them myself. I'd have to... Oh, okay. <laughs> That's I don't okay. go on sponge data. Um, have to um, <laughs> have to have to do some research on that. Sorry. Awesome. Well, that's all the questions we have there. I will just launch a poll. I always forget to do um, just for all the viewers, um, so we can understand how they heard about this Costa Coral's talk and where they're zooming in from. Um,
But thank you so much for donating your time, Eric. I've learned no, heaps no of worries. And, um, new things about sea sponges. Yeah, and people are welcome to contact the museum about anything you anything you find or anything interesting. Yeah, and if you because I know I've worked with a lot of um, other groups before. Like I have worked with you guys before as well. People help identifying things. Um, if you do, you need a really, really good underwater photo, close-up photo, and ultimately you actually need the specimen. I know it's hard when you're just doing fanfic um, study and people know what species are well. With these groups, I can't really tell you exactly what they are without looking at the specimen under the microscope. So sorry, but I can I can give you a hand where I can. But anyway, but people can always send stuff in. I get a lot of um, um people who are, who are doing this commercially can send me stuff. Awesome. Anyway. Well, I'll make sure that we um, put your email in with the YouTube video when we share around um, the video yeah, on all, all our social just, medias. Yeah, is it, is it just on a, it's on a closed group, is it? Uh, we'll share it on an open group, Reef Check Australia. Well, if you're gonna do that, put the, better just put the museum's um, email? information there. Sure. Um, email, thank you. Sure thing. Yeah. It's, it's amazing what, what public inquiries you get. Sometimes it's quite funny. Some people send in some amazing stuff. Some people hold a hold up a coconut at um you know at one end of Main Beach, and their partner from three hundred meters away takes a photo and goes, "What's that?" And you go, "No idea." So, but it's also amazing at the museum. It's quite funny here. We get one person a week um, saying they've seen the Tasmania tiger. So that's how that's how many inquiries we get in the museum. And you've heard about the pyramids of Ginty? Of what? The sorry? pyramids of Ginty. There's a whole set of ah, pyramids yes. of Ginty, yes. identical to the ones in Egypt. It's a government conspiracy. Anyway, so we get a lot of a lot of inquiries about that. So, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sure but, but yeah, always happy to help out citizen science groups as well when I can. So, no worries. Good work, Thank guys. you. Thank you very much for donating your time. Yeah.